And so they started playing games with the egg. And we already saw Yalta Potsdam. There's already a little bit of disagreement about this. But remember, Germany, but also Berlin were divided. There were four occupation zones, and Berlin, which was in the middle of the Soviet occupation zone, had their own four occupation zones. So it's here. Austria is the same way, but they resolved that by just saying Austria will be neutral after the war. They couldn't do that with Germany. They couldn't or wouldn't, is a better way to put it. And so Stalin started using the fact that the Allied occupation zones were in the middle of the Soviet occupation zones. That means any supplies going to the British or the American units had to go through the Soviet occupation zone. So we started playing games like closing roads for repair or closing railroads. We actually did need a lot of repair. And it wasn't just to, to supply the American, the British, and the French brigade, about 3,000 soldiers each of them had there, but also the, the million and a half civilians that lived in the Western occupation zones had to be fed. Germany was a wasteland after the war. One more thing, remember at Potsdam, the Allies said no reparations. Stalin was furious about this. And he basically decided, okay, if you're not gonna give me reparations, I'll take it. And he ordered his troops to take everything of value from the Eastern occupation zone, everything from Germany of value. I mean, they went through and they went into houses that were not destroyed or even destroyed houses and took out furniture. They took boards that weren't destroyed. They even pulled out nails. They took out screws, they took out pipes, they took out uh, toilets, even the kitchen sink, literally. They went through and cut up hunk of the Autobahn, the cement, and put that on the train and sent it back to the Soviet Union. They took everything of value, stripped an already destroyed area. They just dumped the cement and no one knew what to do with it. And the U.S., in theory, cut out then we say. But the United States thinking is, we don't want another situation like happened after World War I with the reparations. The Soviets said, have you seen the Soviet Union? And look what the Germans did to us. 20 million Soviet civilians and soldiers died in the war. They didn't have sympathy for the Germans. And so this, you can see the confrontation. Now, it wasn't done in this form. We're cutting off aid. And war might be next. It was more just kind of happened, little bits and pieces. People sitting in Helena, Montana in 1945, 46 would not have realized how far the governments of this, uh, Washington and Moscow had come apart. And then the next year or the year after the war, Winston Churchill gave a speech. He is no longer prime minister, still a member of parliament. He's doing a speaking tour, you know, politicians, they go get a lot of money to come get speaking tours. Got a million dollars, you can go get Barack Obama to speak at something. They charge a lot of money. But anyways, he was giving a speech, and he gave a speech at obviously that Southwest Missouri State University, right? I mean, where else would the former prime minister of Great Britain go? And he talked about the area under now Soviet control. And he took a name, he copied it from somebody else, but dubbed this the Iron Curtain. And this is the part of the speech from Stettin, 3S, is now behind the Iron Curtain. And what the Iron Curtain meant was areas under Soviet domination, Stalinist puppet states. Sometimes you see them called satellite nations that Stalin has been creating. And this will soon be the Iron Curtain. And Stalin was not going to allow any government close to him and you got in a country close to him, that was not an ally. Never. He wanted a buffer zone. Yes. We're not going to go to all the details of it, but this the thing was that since Nazism started in Germany, they figured they could separate Austria from it. And both sides did not want the confrontation that already happened in Germany and Korea. North and South or East and West. So they just both agreed to me. Because they've seen as smaller and not as uh, internationally as important. But one more thing about this is make sure you know he got he wanted this buffer zone, but to the um, many in America, and you can see how people, let's say this part of Germany, 
or France or whatever. They saw this as a right, a Soviet invasion, a Soviet aid. Where Stalin is going to get this and maybe more. Now, Stalin, of course, would take whatever he could get. But the big thing Stalin wanted was a buffer zone. Germany defeated Russia in World War I, and it came close in World War II. Yes, the Soviets did decisively win, but it was close. He did not make this up. If you see that Churchill made, um, start, um, started this phrase, he got this speech became popular in the term Iron Curtain because of this speech, but he took it from the former propaganda head of Nazi Germany, Joseph Goebbels, who actually talked about an Iron Curtain descending um, following the Soviet forces. Nazi Germany at the end thought they could convince Britain and France, or Britain, the United States and France to join Nazi Germany and defeat the real threat, the Soviet Union. It's kind of ridiculous to think about, but they actually were hoping for that. So when it became known, there are a couple of things happened in Iran, and we're not trying to talk about here, let's stick to the ones we can talk about, Turkey and Greece. Turkey and Greece, when, when this conflict that was still behind the scenes became known, became public, especially in the West, the first time, and it was a shock. And must remember, the economy of the United States, remember after World War I, there was a depression. World War II, not as bad, but there still was one. So there was a communist revolt in Greece. So Greece, that was liberated. Basically, the Germans just evacuated it in 44. The Germans took it in 41. Communist guerrillas had been fighting the Nazis. And then after the war, Britain, which always saw Greece as kind of an important part of their sphere of influence. This is a, an art, a cartoon from Time Magazine, implying that here's Soviet eyeing all these places. So, Britain created a really nasty military dictatorship. They wanted a pro-British government. They didn't want to mess with the democracy. They thought a socialist or communist, who knows what government would win. So the dictatorship, that would last in the 1980s. Greece had a really repressive, awful government in a lot of ways. Well, there's this revolt against the government. And the um, Britain, though so after the war, was completely broke. And they went to the United States. They went to President Truman and basically said, we can no longer fund this dictatorship. And if we can't fund them, the communists might win it. Now, the United States was pulling out of Europe as fast as possible. The United States fought the war. They were, uh, the war was over. The U.S. Army military had gone from over 11 million men and women uniform to a million men and women in uniform in a year. So the U.S. was demobilizing. It's over. The U.S. was not a militaristic country except in times of war. And this is a big shift. One more thing happened. In the 46 midterm elections, conservative Republicans, actually Republicans, but it was a conservative controlled uh, government, they did quite well. They even took control of the House. I put down Congress, but I should say the House. Democrats maintained control of the Senate. The first time since 1930, Republicans. And if you have conservative Republicans and conservative Democrats, they dominated the House and the Senate. Now you have a moderately liberal, economically, President-elect Truman, but he was fighting against a more and more isolationist government. Let's get away from the war and all the death and destruction. Europe was destroyed, that's fine, but we want out of this. We're not going to be brought into another war unless we have to. And so with that, Truman is facing a ho really hostile house. A lot of conservative Democrats in the Senate were upset at him. I'll tell you more about that on Wednesday. Why? And here's Britain asking for money. How does he do it? Well, a little revolt in a dictatorship in Greece, and most Americans didn't care. Do you really want to spend your hard-earned taxpayer money when we're trying to get back to, um, we're trying to um, come out of depression and then war? Don't forget the depression. It's just before this. 
Well, that's not scary. But what about him? And this is the way Truman would look at it. If the communist wins there, it's a victory for Stalin and the leader of the Soviet Union. Communism will advance. So Truman looked at and he said, OK, if I got to convince Congress that we have to aid Greece or Stalin will win. And what he did is this. He asked for aid, but he greatly, and this is not even, greatly not strong. He implied that the Soviet Union was ready to take over. He greatly exaggerated this. He asked for $400 million in aid, which was pretty significant. And this is a cartoon defending this, implying that Stalin is like a big cat playing with, <laughs> playing with Europe and the United States. Just like a cat plays with their prey. And the United States is being humiliated again. And you'll notice one more thing. You notice I said Greece. He also added this New York Times headline shows it. Turkey. There was no communist revolt as we know it in the new Democratic Republic in Turkey. Turkey created their own Democratic Republic after World War I. It took about 20 years, but it's great. But Russia, the only thing about world history, Russia had been eyeing this straight into the Black Sea. They've been eyeing that for 400 years. Russia had been trying to get this. That's one of the big things about World War I, why the Ottoman Empire knew the war on the side of the Central Powers. And so we imply it's not just Greece, it's Greece and Turkey. And if the Soviets get this, they'll be right in the Mediterranean and the rest of Europe will be vulnerable. And if the rest of Europe is vulnerable, what else is vulnerable? Wyoming, right? Yes. I hope not. <laughs> All right, so with that, now, George Keenan, that was in the State Department, would write a letter of foreign affairs. He basically sent a letter to the U.S. government that wrote anonymously. So he just dubbed this the long letter. We warned of the Soviet Union. And he said that the Soviet Union, the Union of Soviet Socialistic Republics, was bent on world domination. And so therefore, we must stop them everywhere. We must stop them. And it's called containment. We must contain communism. So Truman implied that if we don't stop them in Greece, the communism will spread like a disease. Another one from Time Magazine, and it's showing here's direct communist influence, and then here's bigger communist influence, like in Iraq, Turkey, and Greece. And these dots are like spots of like measles or chicken pox, and it's infecting. It's spreading like a disease, and we can't stop them unless we stop it everywhere. Because if we don't stop it in Greece, it will spread. I don't know it has it even in, I know it's Triple Latania, but that's Libya. Yeah. Um, the Union of Soviet Socialistic Republics. That's the name of the country. The official name, but everybody called it the Soviet Union. And the Soviets, that was a term that simply just basically meant workers' organization. So they adopted that term. Hmm? Good. And so with that, they gained flexibility. That would lead to what we call the Truman Doctrine, which is containment. Now make sure you tie this to the other, it's containment. And what Truman would make this speech, it's just a speech, it's not law, but it was so effective that it would grow way beyond what Truman was initially thinking. It would be the policy for well over 40 years, or I'm sorry, seven years. It's the policy of the United Foreign Policy still to this day. And the goal was implied that we must defend democracy. When Truman gave the speech to Congress, and that's him giving the speech, and he really laid into the fear. He tried to scare people to death. We are defending democracy. Democracy in Greece, democracy in Turkey. But there wasn't a democracy in Greece. But he knew the United States wanted to believe it was fighting for democracy. Now, will this have implications down the road? And one more thing. 
the United States still has Truman Doctrine as the basis of its foreign policy. Everybody from Blinken on down the Secretary of State, President Biden, but everybody else. I would say with the Trump administration, George W. Bush, Obama administration, they all have been educated with Truman Doctrine thing. And it's just going to go on and on. The United States is doing containment right now, doing alliances, massive weapons uh, deals, including like nuclear submarines for Australia to contain what country? China. Yeah. Did someone have their hand up for that? This theory over exaggeration of communists and what made it red scare. Well, we remember, we already had the red scare before, but it'll certainly help make the second red scare. Yeah. But we're, then it'll be a, it's going to be a collective freak out in the United States in 1949. Yes. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. What a great way to attack somebody, say they're a communist. Or if they're, they're not fully red, they're a pink. And so with that, and so Truman gave this speech, and he had these basic tenets. Why would must we contain? Number one, communism is an ideological part. What I mean by that is it's something about your belief system. It's not that you're, let's say, you know, think about World War II. Not, we're not fighting the Germans or the Japanese. It's something in your mind. But another very important part about it, it's indivisible, since we just did the um, by mandated by state law, all of you did the Pledge of Allegiance, which was written by a socialist, by the way. But the Pledge of Allegiance, they haven't been indivisible. What does indivisible mean? Yeah, can't be divided, cannot be broken up. That means one communist is the same as any other communist. A communist in Moscow is the same as a communist in China, the same as a communist in Greece, the same as a communist in Wyoming. All roads lead to Wyoming, right? They're all the same. So you can't distinguish between the revolution in Greece or the communist revolution that's happening right now, right at the same time in China. They're the same thing as the Bolsheviks in 1917. Now, that's patently ridiculous. The reason for communist rebellion, or the, the so-called communist guerrillas in Greece have nothing to do with why there is a growing communist revolt in post-war China. Or for that matter, why the Bolsheviks. There are things going on in Greece, I bet you. But isn't this simple? Do you need to think anymore? Life is so easy. Next. Next. The domino effect. You might have heard it called the domino theory, but originally Keenan and Truman called it the domino effect. Domino theory, domino effect, the same thing. The struggle could be anywhere because it's basically a bipolar or two sides in the world. And because of the domino effect, this struggle could be anywhere and we must stop the enemy because if Greece falls like a row of dominoes, what's the next country to go? Turkey, so we'll start going this way, and then Italy, right? Switzerland. France, Belgium, Netherlands, England, Ireland, and then what? Wyoming. Thank you. Wyoming is next. Like a row of dominoes. Now, once again, that implies that the issues in Greece have anything to do with the issues of post war Italy. Or for the matter, there's a lot of issues in Wyoming. Sorry. But, but isn't it so easy? Now, this is a very good map. You know, it has the basic elements of it. It's, good. it's big enough I can point to it. I like to point at maps. Comfortable. We should have arrows. Arrows would be better. But it has orange and green. During the Cold War, every map, and I can still vividly remember these. I grew up in the Cold War. That was red. And what color was this? Blue. It was red and blue. Us and then. Free world and slave world. Life is so easy, this one. It gets away from all the complexity. Check. Yeah. In the United States, like the political colors are blue and red. Did that change now that they were like communist? They changed some colors. Well, remember I told you about that. That was in 2000, that, that whole blue and red thing. Yeah. So. Oh, no. Yeah. So. I know what you're thinking. Then you're like, oh, yeah. yeah. So, no, there was no blue or red. 
Yeah. Did, did they change the color because they still wanted to have people painting every? It could be out of that, yeah. It, it does make it hard to separate the water. You have different shades of blue. And last thing about it then. What I can't, but I can't emphasize this enough, how easy this is. You don't have to worry about complexities or nuance. The world is very complex. This is not complex, is it? It's us versus them. You're either with us or you're the enemy. By the way, if the struggle could be anywhere, where is anywhere? In here, right here in this classroom. And if it's an ideological threat, that means something in your mind bored a hole, infected you, and drilled a hole into your skull and took over your brain and your thinking. It's changed you. Oh, you look like everybody else, but you're different. And you're just waiting to pounce. And what does a communist look like? The obviously you have red, so red, but blue, that's what a communist would wear. If they're trying to act like they were not a communist, right? Green. And then look at gray. Yeah, not full of the G. Hand up, communist. Hand down, communist. Could anybody be an enemy? Yeah. Uh, well, what if then, what if they wore that old red color from the same all around the green? The what? What if they? I don't have to think about that one for a while. So, also, what they can say then is every revolt, every fall, even this has been important. Remember the anti union feeling about bomb throwing anarchists and the Red Scare. They could say even labor strikes could be corrupted from the Kremlin. Remember, if every communist is the same, it's implied that it's all an apparatchik of Stalin. So here's Stalin, these are, it's hard to read, but they're all country names. And he's like hitting a button to start a revolution in all these places, just because he can do it. Okay. And there's this vision of like Stalin puffing his pipe with a big map of the world and going, today we'll have a revolution in Greece. Tomorrow, labor violence in Japan. Like he's just picking places out. And here's his, his foreign minister, Molotov, and it's like doing one of those, like spinning a globe and like putting your finger down wherever it lands. That's where the revolution will be. Now, it's implying that these are all just caused by the Soviet Union, not, not what's going on inside the country. Oh, sure. They might help a little bit, but what it means is it's a zero sum game. We can't all grow. It's if we lose Greece, the Soviets gain. And now we're behind. It is like a check off of countries. Who's allied with us? Who's not allied with us? And as countries like Britain broke after the war, start losing their colonies, there'll be a fight for those unaligned countries. Yep. Have you ever heard the term third world? That's where that comes from. We're the first world. Commies are the second. It's a fight for the third. There'll be other connotations of that down the road, but that's how it initiates. Now, this is a, the basis of American foreign policy from now on, and this will change everything. Truman did it with short term thinking, thinking I need to get aid for Greece. So we exaggerate, but by exaggerating, change the world. And one more thing, the United States is at peace, but it's gone now to a low grade total war thinking that was made. Or there might be an enemy within. Remember the whole justification for the Espionage Act and social unity, even Wars of genocide, like in Turkey, this enemy within that we can trust. This enemy within. Now, it did work. Congress did approve $400 million. And this is one of those moments in history. Boom, everything changed. We are forever going to be a different country. The country pre World War II. The United States was, yes, very much a trading power, but not involved in the government or the politics or even that much foreign aid will change to for everyone. Everyone. If almost 400 military bases. The U.S. is everywhere. Not as strong as we used to be either, so they start to stretch. Yeah. 
do you think that this like black and white thinking of this system came a little bit from um, there's an element of that, sure. Yeah. There's an element of that, sure. You know, this idea that us versus them, especially since this was not the reality of the world. And so the Truman Doctrine really wasn't uh, an effective policy to deal with the nuances of the world. What it was, was all domestic politics. Before we get to that, though, to do this, the United States is going to abandon the market. I'm not saying the U.S. did not support democracy before. Remember, one of the reasons the United States entered World War I was to make the world safe for democracy. The United States would justify everything in World War II to try to bring democracy and self-determination to people. That was the whole goal of the United Nations. But not now. The United States said democracy yet supported a horrific dictatorship in Greece. That still affects Greece today. We did that, democ or that dictatorship would not enter the 1980s. That's not that long ago. And almost all of our aid after this, it's going to be military. Keenan was thinking we'll stop and contain communism by putting better economic systems at the West, but it turned into solely military aid. The United States gives almost no foreign aid that's not military. We just send weapons. We don't give very much foreign aid anyway. We give just a tiny percentage of our budget less than 1%, and almost all of it's military. And who gets most of the aid? Who, who's the biggest recipient of U.S. foreign aid, which is all military? You know what country? Who? Today. It's all weapons. You need... And one more, yeah. This was supporting fascism rather than democracy. Well, it's going to be a problem because the, the United States did not particularly like fascism, but uh, even though Truman hated the fascist dictator of Spain, Eisenhower would embrace racism. Fascism, their main element was anti communist. So it's going to be a problem. That's going to lead to this is a good point American credibility. Because the United States will state it's for democracy, it's for dictatorship after dictatorship. To this day. And the problem with that is soon people will question your motives. For good reason, they should question your motives. It doesn't mean you're a bad person or a good person if someone questions your motives. But the point is, a lot of people are going to grow to distrust the United States. And this is really going to shock Americans. By the 1950s, there will be countries very upset, especially in Latin America, where we'll really see this. It's beginning in the 1970s, American support of really brutal dictatorships in the Middle East. That's where you're really going to see it. The number one reason Osama bin Laden and a group called Al Qaeda, who the United States helped create, would attack on September 11, 2001, was support of brutal dictatorships in the Middle East. Now, it doesn't excuse them for the attack, but this is really going to hurt America. Or we're going to see this down the road. But I love these cartoons. These are two really good ones. First off, we just throw money at the Mediterranean. And that basically is weapons. Okay. Here's one of the best cartoons in, of this era, 1947. And it's Uncle Sam who has eight degrees in Turkey. And you know, it's blindfolded, trying to see its way forward. And it's very rickety. New American foreign policy. We have no idea what this is going to do. You still have to deal with that. In 1953, the United States is going to help overthrow a homegrown democracy in Iran. And the U.S. and the rest of the world will never stop paying for it. And Iran, it's going to be a big deal down the road. So the thing about it is, is that this is not the reality of the world. This is all domestic politics. And it's all done. Truman was not doing this because of Turkey. He really didn't care about Greece. But this fear of communism will forever taint domestic politics. And no politician after this will say, well, especially think about Truman. Truman said, we must do everything we can to stop the communists in Greece or Wyoming is next. Okay. But what happens if it happens if it's in Iran or China or a place called South Korea? 
Are we going to turn around and say, yeah, but South Korea is not that big? Now he's stuck. Everybody's stuck because if he says, no, we don't need to stop him there, they'll say, you're making us vulnerable. The term they would use is, you're soft on communism. If you're soft on communism, we're all vulnerable. And that's where the term pinko would be thrown about all the time. You're not truly a red, but you're kind of a red. You're a pinko. Now, even though there'd be one two-year term that Republicans would take over the House, for the most part, this is a very much a Democratic era. And so Republicans would jump on this. And they're going to call it red baiting. GOP, remember, that's Republicans. And that's why they attack Democrats. Who was president at Yalta? Roosevelt. Who was president at Potsdam? Truman. Who was president who announced the great threat of the communists? It's Truman. That means the Democrats must have allowed this. They literally called it red baiting. 46, it was an issue. 48, it would be a major issue. This relatively unknown uh, politician named Richard Nixon would become the master of red bait, calling their, con their, their uh, political opponents a communist. And I should add that Republicans did it first because they were the party that was the minority, but Democrats would soon be doing it too. And there's a direct line between this thinking, you can start seeing the growth of what's going to become McCarthyism or the second red scare. I've already mentioned that before, but there has to be a couple more events happen. Something really big is going to happen in 49. Two big things that will shake American attitudes to its very core. But it's just starting here. Oh, this is one of these. A number of groups, especially church groups, are putting out these books saying this is American or communism and flying. They're actually these weird, creepy comments. They're both kind of funny, humorous, and also scary. But military spending started to go up. Now, you're not going to see this immediately, but we see the beginning of the United States becoming a militaristic power. And with that, well, now we might have another war. One of these acts would pass that Kind of goes on recording. You know, it was important, but nobody realized how this would forever change the United States. Called the National Security Act, so Truman Doctrine National Security Act. It did something on the surface that made sense. There was a separate War and Navy Department. It combined those into its uh, one Department of Defense, and it created a separate Air Force. The Air Force was part of the Army. So you have the Army, Navy, and the Air Force. The Marines are part of the Navy. If you want to have fun, you go tell a Marine, especially someone that's been there for a while, that the Marines are part of the Navy. They really appreciate it. You'll make a friend for life. Don't do that. Some of you know. Uh, during the Trump administration, they created something called the Space Force, but that was more, I, I'm not even sure what it was. They have a slide that looked like it's from Star Trek and it's called Force Movie. Yeah. We're not a bunch of saves. Oh, oh, I know. I know. But you know, it's amazing what people can allow themselves to get mad at, and other people say, why it's such a big deal. I don't care to me, it's a big deal. So, but if there's going to be communists all over, potentially we have to stop them. We got to know if they're coming. They created a brand new group called the Central Intelligence Agency. Now, what is the term for spying on somebody, gathering information? Espionage. And it's only overseas. It's only overseas. At least until the war on the 2000. And it's only espionage. They cannot commit sabotage. They cannot uh, commit terrorist acts. And they cannot assassinate, according to the law. Because I had to follow my them. Now, this is the first time we've had a large organization of spies. So this is the beginning of a secret police. Didn't really exist before, but now, hey, we have enemies all over. Remember what I told you? It's all being directed by the Kremlin. We got to know if they're doing it here. Think about total war thinking. 
and one more big spy group called the National Security Agency, which is actually much bigger and even more secretive than the uh, CIA. And even though that's supposed to be foreign espionage, they can look at foreign espionage looking back into the United States. It's the NSA that reads all your emails. Cognitive text. They don't read them. They just store them. Uh, sure. I mean, and everyone says that. But of course, if you're looking, you can always find something. Always find something. All right, everybody, we'll see you. Yeah. Come on in. Are you having one? Do you have a house? Do you have a house? No, I don't have a house. Yep, so paper. Um, go paper. Okay. It's paper out and I'll put it in all that. Okay, yep. Yeah. Bye. Bye. First of all, you want classes? You have to go to the library and check in there. So hopefully, I'll have a bunch of tables because it's going to be every junior. Yeah, I should know there'd be like specific class here. Wait a second. As I understand it, you'll get your classroom assignments 